Hi everybody, my name is Elizabeth and I'm a librarian here at the LSC Tomball Community Library. Welcome back to Screenshots, the series where I recommend to you great movies that you can watch for free with your library card. As I'm sure you are all already aware, it is February and February is Black History Month. Black filmmakers and black film have contributed some of the most exciting works in the history of the medium. So I really could not be more excited to share some of those fantastic pieces of art with you today. So stay tuned to learn about four great movies by black filmmakers that you can watch for free through the Harris County Public Library. Let's get started. To begin this discussion, we're going to start pretty close to home. Something that I didn't know prior to moving to Texas was that this was actually the last state to ban slavery. Although President Abraham Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation in 1862, which formally banned slavery in the United States, by 1865 there were still an estimated 250,000 enslaved people in Texas. They had been brought to Texas by wealthy planters from the Confederate States who had fled west from the conflict happening during the Civil War. And through a combination of both stubbornness and also a breakdown of communication in what was then still the American frontier, meant that a full three years after the Civil War was over, there were still enslaved people in Texas. On June 19th of 1865, Union Major General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston to oversee the emancipation of Texas's remaining enslaved people, officially ending the practice of slavery in the United States. And now still, the 19th of June, colloquially known as Juneteenth, is a holiday celebrating the full and complete eradication of the institution of slavery in the United States. Channing Godfrey Peoples' 2020 film Miss Juneteenth follows the ramifications of this moment in history in a contemporary suburb of Fort Worth as a mother is trying to convince her young daughter to compete in the Miss Juneteenth pageant, a beauty pageant for young black girls which promises a college scholarship to whoever wins. Miss Juneteenth tackles some weighty themes like the continuing struggle of black people for equality and respect even though slavery ended almost 200 years ago, and also the unique intersectional experience of being both black and a woman in the United States. But it doesn't do this through big melodramatic set pieces like you might see from similar movies. In fact, Miss Juneteenth is notable for its leisurely, hospitable pace. You get to watch as these themes impact the daily lives of our two central characters, Turquoise and her 15-year-old daughter Kai, and how these things impact them as they move through their daily lives. Miss Juneteenth was an indie darling when it toured the festival circuit last year, and it's really not hard to see why. It provides a nuanced, thoughtful look into what it's like to be a black woman in contemporary Texas, and it does this with characters that are so well-rounded and likable that you find yourself invested in their success and their happiness. You can check out Miss Juneteenth on DVD from the Harris County Public Library, or you can also watch it right now on Canopy. Miss Juneteenth is a very grounded, down-to-earth film, almost recalling the overwhelmingly white, mumblecore scene of the early 2000s. The next film we're going to talk about is still very grounded in history, but loosens its grip on reality a little bit. Julie Dash's 1991 film, Daughters of the Dust. Although Dash was born in New York and received a film degree in Los Angeles, her father's family were actually part of the Gullah culture, a unique African-American community centered in the lowlands region of the American Southeast. The Gullah were originally brought to the United States as enslaved people from Africa, but the relative geographic isolation of this region allowed them to retain much of their African language and customs, blending in interesting ways with the American and English cultures that they interacted with to create something that was wholly their own. Daughters of the Dust tells a fictionalized version of the story of Dash's Gullah family, 
And although the central premise of the film is several members of the family leaving their ancestral home for the mainland, it does this mainly through a series of elliptical dreamlike images. And it's these images that are what Daughters of the Dust is primarily known for. In fact, if any of it looks familiar, it's probably because Beyonce cited it as the primary inspiration behind the film that went along with her 2016 album Lemonade. Although every second of this film is gorgeous, it's hardly romanticized, and it deals frankly with the struggles of being a woman, being black, and also being part of a minority culture that's struggling to survive in an increasingly homogenous world. For fans of Terrence Malick, Ethnography, and Beyonce, you can check out Daughters of the Dust on DVD from the Harris County Public Library. If you've been keeping up with movies for the last few years, then you might think that we're living in a post-genre world. Films like Bong Joon-ho's masterful Parasite or Robert Eggers' The Lighthouse don't neatly fit into any particular category. But films that are not easy to categorize have existed forever, and one of my favorite examples of this actually came out a full year before both Parasite and The Lighthouse, and is just in general one of my favorite films from the 2010s. I'm talking about Boots Riley's 2018 film, Sorry to Bother You. Now, I'm not normally a stickler about spoilers, but I do think that some of the fun of this film is experiencing what it's all about in real time. So I'm just going to give you the basics. Cash Green, played by the absolutely amazing Lakeith Stanfield, is an aimless young man who takes a job as a telemarketer to keep from being evicted from his apartment. He fails to make any real sales until another black telemarketer advises him to affect a white-sounding voice on the phone, at which point he begins to excel, far outpacing his colleagues. What begins as an absurdist comedy, albeit one with a little bit of a bite to it, gradually morphs into something much more unsettling and confrontational. That's really all I want to tell you about this movie, and I encourage you to learn as little about it as possible before you watch it, but I will tell you that even with every turn into unexpected territory, this movie is consistently really, really entertaining. You can check out Sorry to Bother You on DVD from the Harris County Public Library. As I've said before in this series, horror is my favorite genre of film, and it is a fantastic time to be a horror fan. We're seeing the resurgence of subgenres that have fallen out of fashion in the past, like folk horror with movies like Midsummer, as well as horror that finds its terror in the real life horror of living a marginalized life, like the feminine horror we see with films like The Babadook or The Invisible Man. But one of the most exciting trends in horror right now is the horror that is being made by black filmmakers. Jordan Peele is the obvious frontrunner of the black horror wave with films like Get Out and Us, but black filmmakers have been making horror films for decades. And the last film I want to talk about today is a perfect example of that. Bill Gunn's 1973 film Ganja and Hess. At its heart, Ganja and Hess is a vampire movie. Anthropologist Hess Green, who is played by Dwayne Jones, who actually starred in Night of the Living Dead, is stabbed by a ceremonial dagger that is said to belong to an ancient African civilization known as the Murthians, who were said to drink human blood. This dagger gives Hess immortality, but only insofar as he can consume the blood of his fellow humans essentially turning him into a vampire. Ganja and Hess is a really interesting film for a number of reasons. The first would have to be the cinematography, which is jumpy and experimental and gives kind of an art house feel to what might seem at first to be a pretty traditional horror movie. But the second, which is doubly interesting, I think, is how it recontextualizes vampirism. Although other cultures have creatures that are similar to vampires in their mythologies, the contemporary idea of the vampire is heavily tied to a very European context. Think Grand Castles, Transylvania, and the idea that being a vampire makes you ghostly pale. 
Ganja and Hess imagines a mythology where vampires come from a uniquely African context, making this a vampire film unlike any you've probably ever seen. Ganja and Hess was made on a shoestring budget of about $350,000, and because of that, it is starting to show its age a little bit. But even with that in mind, this is a fascinating film and a very worthy ancestor of the contemporary wave of black horror films that we're seeing today. You can watch Ganja and Hess on Canopy. Thank you for watching this episode of Screenshots. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and Twitter so that you never miss a future episode of Screenshots or any of our other great online programs. Please let me know if you watch any of these films. I think these are all really exciting, although of course the number of contributions that black filmmakers have made cannot all be covered in a single 10 minute video. Thank you again for watching and I hope you all have a wonderful Black History Month. Bye.